So this is problem four in formation and operations of partnership. So a partnership has the following income and expenses for the past calendar year. Gross income from business operations, expenses deductible under section 162. So we're talking about trade or business expenses, like operating expenses, like advertising, compensation, utilities, those kinds of things. Depreciation on machinery, charitable gifts, gain on sale of equipment used in, a, in the partnership business. Now it's a $30 gain. Part of the gain is section 1231. Part of it's section 1245, depreciation recapture. So broken out. Short-term capital gain on stock sale. Interest on tax-exempt bonds. Dividends on stock. And gain on the sale of land held for four years, which the partnership held the land as an investment. Which, because it's held as an investment, it's going to be a capital asset. And that means it's going to be a long-term capital gain because it's a capital asset being sold, held for more than a year. So long-term capital gain of $100 for the last one there. we got two partners, Apricot and Boysenberry. Sometimes I might refer to them as A and B. I might say Apricot, Boysenberry. Sometimes I might say A and B. Are equal partners who use the calendar year as their taxable years. So we have four different questions to address in this problem. Let's start with question one. How will the partnership, Apricot and Boysenberry, report these items? So first... It's easiest to start with the partnership. So the partnership files form 1065. And the 1065 is made up on the first page of ordinary business income and loss. Now, partnerships do not pay double taxation like C corporations. And in general, partnerships don't even pay tax because the level of tax is at the owner level. So when a partnership files, it's mostly an informational return where what happens is the information flows out to the owners. So we got the Form 1065, which, again, the beginning, we've got ordinary business income loss, but we also have Schedule K. And the Schedule K is where we find the separately stated items. Now, separately stated items are items that, depending on how they go out to the partners, can have a difference, whether it's various limitations that the partners might have on deductions or capital gain, capital loss limitations, or Section 1231, where it's determined at the partner level. So when we go through these nine items, what we're going to do is we're going to look at each of these, and we're going to determine, hey, is this something that's going to be lumped together because it makes no difference what kind of owner? And by the way, we don't look at tax rates when we focus on different types of owners. We just lump them together as ordinary income, ordinary loss. That's why it's called ordinary business income loss. But if it has some type of limitation or it's determined some specific way for a partner, we're going to talk about all these things. And it's any hypothetical. All right. So we're going to set this up. And I'm going to erase this because we're going to need to give, us, give ourselves kind of like a chart. And the chart, when we're thinking about these things, we have these nine transactions. We've got our ordinary business income or loss. And again, this is what gets lumped together. We have our separately stated items, SS for separately stated. And we also have a column for non-taxable items. So for income, like tax-exempt interest income, this stuff still needs to be separately reported, and it actually goes on Schedule K into the K-1 for the owners. So I mentioned the Schedule K for the partnership for the owners, and we'll talk about the owners, right, Ap Apricot and Boysenberry later, but they get a K-1 that flows out to them. But right now we're focusing on, on the uh, Form 1065, Page 1, and Schedule K for the partnership. So the non-taxable items, talk about things like tax-exempt interest, right, that's non-taxable but it still needs to be reported, and I'll explain why later on, and also non-deductible items like fines and penalties, those things can't be deducted by anybody, still need to be reported as well because they have an effect on things. So the first item we have is the gross income from business operations, $130. So the question you're asking is, 
is this something that can make a difference depending on the type of owner? And the answer for gross income or business operations is no. This gets reported as gross income. The general rule is that when it comes to ordinary income, it gets lumped into the ordinary business income loss that can be lumped together. There's a few exceptions for this, but when it comes to income, the general rule is it's going to be ordinary business income loss gets lumped on there. So that is what it is. Let's create some, some rows to help us with this. All right, so we got our nine rows for our nine different transactions. Again, gross income for business operations. That goes under the ordinary business income loss. That's 130 there. Expenses deductible under Section 162A, trader business expenses. Again, normal operating expenses. Can you think of any limitation that would apply to different partners or different owners? Any hypothetical, whether it's a C corporation partner, individual partner, trust or estate partner. No, there's not. So it goes into the ordinary business income loss that gets lumped together on page one. So that's a negative. So you do positives for income, negatives for deductions or expenses, right, or losses. We're going to come back to depreciation on machinery because that one's a little tricky. What about charitable gifts? So charitable gifts, can you think of any possible way that any hypothetical potential owner of any partnership out there in the tax universe ever could have some type of difference where the partner needs to know, hey, $20, I need to know the amount of the actual charitable interest. Because the idea here is that when the ordinary business income loss item gets lumped together as a total amount, you don't get the breakdown of each item. So is there any possible way that the charitable gifts, you need to know exactly the amount? Yes. So in taxation, there's lots of limitations on charitable contributions. Individuals versus corporations have different charitable contribution limitations. If you contribute to a certain type of charitable entity, right, public charity versus a private foundation, Depending on the type of property, cash versus long-term capital gain property versus short-term capital gain property versus lost property. It makes a difference depending on the type or the limitation. 60% AGI, 50% AGI, 30% AGI, different AGI limitations. If you're a corporate owner, you get 10% taxable income limit. So it does make a difference. And therefore, and it's any possible owner ever is what you're asking, we're going to have a separately stated item of 20 now, charitable contributions are also interesting because charitable contributions under the tax law in Section 703 also are considered non-taxable to the partnership. You don't get a deduction. Basically, the idea here is it's a little weird when you think of the law. The partners are the one that get the benefit. The partnership does not get to take the deduction for a charitable contribution. So that's why in Section 703, we have a specific rule that says that the partnership is considered non-taxable to them. But the partner still gets the benefit. All right, the next one. We've got a gain of $30 total. $20 of that is Section 1245, Ordinary Income Recapture because of depreciation. And then we've got 1231 gain of $10. So let's start with the Section 1245 gain of $20. Well, that's going to be treated as ordinary income. And again, the general rule for ordinary income is it goes into the ordinary business income item, and that is correct. It does. So we've got $20 of ordinary income. What about the $10 of Section 1231 gain? Is there any reason why a partner, again, needs to know specifically that amount? And the answer is yes. The reason is because Section 1231, remember, at the end of the year, 
You put everything in the Section 1231 hodgepots, and it makes a difference whether it's long-term capital versus ordinary. So that is determined at the partner level. So that means that any Section 1231 gains or losses will go under separately stated. So that's going to be $10. And I'm going to note, this is 1245 Right, the twenty dollars is section twelve forty five, and this is section twelve thirty one, the ten. All right, short term capital gain on stock sale, capital gains, capital losses, always separately stated because there's capital gain, capital loss limitations at the partner level. Interest on tax exempt bonds of forty dollars, that's going to be non taxable because the partnership does not have to pay tax on that, and the partners don't have to pay tax as well. Dividends on stock. Dividends on stock are going to be separately stated for two different reasons. Again, you're thinking about any possible way that could create a difference. Why a partner needs to know this specific item, you can't lump it together as one lump sum amount. Two reasons. Individuals, at the time of this video, get preferential tax rates on certain dividends. But even beyond that, let's say that there was no preferential. Let's say that all dividends were treated as ordinary. Corporations get the dividend receive deduction, and you get to take a deduction for any dividends received. So right there, we've got our two reasons for dividends to be separately stated. And then finally, the gain on the sale of land, which again was a long-term capital gain. All long-term, all capital gains are going to be treated as separately stated. So we got 100 separately stated gain. Okay, let's go back to the depreciation. So now that we've seen some of the big examples of things that are separately stated out there versus ordinary business income loss, and again, these are the main ones. If you go look at a Schedule K or a K1 for the partner, you'll see a lot of these broken out, but not all of them will be broken out because there's other income, other loss that have to be separately stated. There's lines for that. And in practice, we have to think about these types of ideas. Are there any reasons why a partner would need to know the specific amount? It can't just be lumped together. That's kind of the idea. Okay? So for depreciation, this one's probably the most trick or the trickiest. You gotta read the whole thing. Depreciation on machinery is calculated under the 200 percent declining balance method. So the question is. Can any possible partner, any possible partner, yes, our situation has ap apricot and boysenberry, most likely individuals, not C corporations, but any possible partner out there in the universe, would it make a difference and they need to know this exact amount? And the answer is yes. Where? C corporations. So an important aspect of C corporations is earnings and profits. To determine if a distribution is taxable, we need to know earnings and profits. Well, earnings and profits is similar to financial accounting retained earnings. Not identical, but similar. It is calculated in the tax law under Section 312 of the Internal Revenue Code. We start with taxable income of the partner. Which are we talking taxable income? Sorry, the corporation, my apologies, which here would be a potential partner. We adjust for things that would then reflect financial accounting. Now, most businesses, for financial accounting purposes, use straight line depreciation. However, this partnership is doing double declining balance. So when we're adjusting our taxable income to get financial accounting or something similar to financial accounting, earnings and profits for tax purposes, guess what? We need to know, hey, we took $30 of Double client balance appreciation that would be determined differently if we did straight line. That's the idea. So this $30 of depreciation is considered a separately stated item. $30 of separately stated depreciation. Now, what if I told you that it was calculated under straight line method? It wouldn't be separately stated. Most likely. There might be some real crazy situation, but it would not be separately stated. Because again, double client balance for tax, financial accounting, almost always book. So that's why this would be separ a separately stated item, not bottom line. Okay, so we've gone through all the items. Now what we do, we're still looking at the partnership. On page one, we got our ordinary business income loss. We have these lines. 
we get our total amount. So we lump these together. So we get total of 110. Separately stated, we do not lump together on the partnership side of things. Same with the non-taxable items. We don't lump those together. Those go separately. Okay. So Form 1065, page 1, we show 110 of ordinary business income loss. We show all these separately stated non-taxable items on Schedule K. At this point, you can stop the video, go look at a Form 1065, and see what I'm saying. Now we're looking at the partners. So the partners each get a Schedule K-1 that shows their distributive share of the items. So again, partnerships are not subject to double taxation. They're subject to single level taxation, flow through taxation, which means the owners are the ones that pay tax. How do they pay the tax? The partner doesn't pay the tax. Par I'm sorry, partnership doesn't pay the tax. The partner does, and it's on allocated items. Here we're told the partners are equal partners, and the general rule is that we allocate using the partnership agreement with some limitations based on substantial economic effect. We're not going to get into that very advanced issue. So here, they're one half partners. Nothing about special allocations, so we're assuming that that's going to be fine. That's going to be a one-half, one-half allocation. So on each partner's K-1, and the K-1 is, is structured very similar to the Schedule K on the Form 1065, we're going to have each partner's share. Apricot's going to get a K-1. Boysenberry gets a K-1. It shows their percentage ownership, their liabilities, and it shows all these Schedule K items, 1 through 20 and whatnot. You know, the, the numbers change. Some years it's gone, I've gone down. So on, with respect to ordinary business income loss, which is actually line one of the Schedule K-1, Apricot and Boysenberry, both 50-50 partners, right, 50% partners, 55 goes to A, and 55 goes to B. That's line one. That's how they report it. With respect to all the separately stated and non-taxable items, each of these items will be broken out 50-50. So let's take, for example, the 100 long-term capital gain, the last transaction for the, for the sale of the land. So that 100 would go on the line for long-term capital gains. 50 of that would go to A on, the, on A's K-1. 50 would go to B on B's K-1. And we do that for all these items, even the tax-exempt items. Now, the charitable contribution goes through charitable contribution, but the $40 of tax-exempt for the tax-exempt income, that is actually a line on the K-1. It's an item. And that would go 40, 20 to A, 20 to B. Like that. So you break it down. And that's how the partners report this, these share of items. And you do that for each separately stated and non-taxable item. So the only thing that's lumped together is ordinary business income loss. So now you kind of see how the picture, the package kind of comes together, like the puzzle comes together. The whole, I, the whole reason why we have separately stated items is because the partners, all they get is a Schedule K-1, and whatever goes in the ordinary business income loss, this 110 number, it gets lumped together. It's not broken out. It doesn't say, hey, we had 130 of gross income, 40 of Section 162 expenses, and 20 of 1245 income. No, it's just... Hey, we had 110 of ordinary business income loss. So that's, again, the reason why some of these items, we need to know the exact amounts because you need to know, hey, I received $30 of Section 1231 gain from the partnership, but I've got other 1231 gains and losses, and I need to put them all together to know, and you can't lump it with the other, other amounts because if you did, you wouldn't know, hey, of the 110, how much is Section 1231 gain? That's the reason why. All right, so that's, pro that's question one. Question two. So let's go back to that last transaction. Gain on the sale of land held for four years by the partnership for investment. We determined, hey, it's an investment asset, capital asset. It's a sale, right? Gain on the sale. So we've got section 1222, a, a sale of a capital asset. Boom. Capital gain. It's been held for more than a year. Long-term capital gain. We got long-term capital gain. The question is, what if Apricot was a dealer in land, or real estate, I should say, right? Dealer, land, real estate. So here's the issue, is that this long-term capital gain is being allocated out to Apricot A 
But if A was to sell land, his or herself, guess what the land would be treated like? Inventory, ordinary income. So this would be actually ordinary income if A was the one that sold the land. So the question is, does that make a difference? If A is what we call a dealer in the land, where land is then considered inventory, and we all know that inventory results in ordinary income, ordinary loss, would it have a different result here? And the answer is no change. Why? Because we focus on how the partnership holds the property. Now, there is an exception to this, and that's what the question is still getting at. So the next part of the question is, assuming the alternative, that the partnership acquired the land from Apricot as a contribution. So we're continuing with that assumption. Let's say that A is a dealer in land. If A contributed the land, there's a special rule found in the partnership tax law that says that, hey, if you contribute inventory, It'll stay inventory to the partnership. For some things, and there, there's other areas where this applies to, and there's a five-year rule. Some things it applies regardless. Other things it applies within five years. Like with that, after five years, it goes away. But even if it was a five-year rule, which for inventory, it's a hard set rule, it's still within five years because it was, you know, it was only held for four years. But the idea here is, let's say A is a dealer. If A was to sell the land, it'd be inventory and therefore ordinary. But A gets smart and gets sneaky, and A transfers the property to a partnership where now the, the partnership holds his investment, and guess what? Now it's treated as long-term capital gain. So some of you out there are probably thinking, this is the perfect way to avoid ordinary income. I can put it in a partnership, call it an investment, and guess what? The taint of A being a dealer and it'd be ordinary income, right? Subject to, at the time of this video, 37% tax rate rather than a 20% capital gains tax rate, you get a 17% tax savings. Congress and the partnership tax law said, no, 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 it's too good to be true. So special rule, if A contributes it, it's always going to be viewed as inventory. So it would make a difference. So if A was a dealer and A contributed it, and then the partnership later sells it as an investment, it's considered inventory. So it would affect this problem. It would make the $100 of cap, long-term capital gain move over to the ordinary business income as $100 of ordinary income. Then we change it around again, and we say, okay, if A is a dealer, but land, but the land was purchased from a third party, well, in this situation, now it's okay. It's okay to be long-term capital gain. The taint of A being a dealer is not a problem. Because you got it from a third party. You didn't get it from A. So that is okay. So that's kind of writing another exception to the exception. Lots of exceptions to exceptions in tax law, right? And that's the idea of problem two. So again, to summarize, the general rule is we focus on how the partnership holds the property, what they do with it. Right here, it's an investment. However, we saw an exception when, hey, A was a dealer, and it would be considered inventory to A, and A contributed it. And then it made it ordinary. But if we do have a dealer, and it's not contributed by A, and it's contributed by someone that's not a dealer, then guess what? A's taint is not going to make the partnership suffer. Okay, so that's number two. So let's go to number three. So number three and four focus on basis. Okay? So we're told that Apricot's basis for his partnership interest was $20 at the beginning of the taxable year. What was his adjusted basis at the end of the year? All right, so this actually isn't too bad. In a simple situation like this, it gets a lot more difficult in practice, trust me. We're focusing on simple. For CPA exam, this class, 
very simple level. You can have very, very difficult issues when you're determining basis. So Section 705 of the Internal Revenue Code, remember, the 700s are where we find the partnership stuff. We know that on formation or contribution, you carry over your basis under Section 721, 722, 723, those rules, the, the formation contribution rules. But this question is saying, hey, after operations, what happens to your basis? So Section 705 says that we start with our beginning outside adjusted basis. And then we're going to increase that during the year for shares of income and gain for each, you know, for the respective partner. Because now we're looking at the partner. This question is now a partner question. We also increase for um, tax exempt income. Why do we do this? And this gets to the reason why the non taxable $40 of tax exempt interest income had to be reported because if we didn't your partnership interest would be worth economically more than the basis that you increased it and you'd be taxed on it and then you'd have double taxation that is why so your partnership interest is worth something and tax and municipal bond interest for example right to, um, tax exempt under section not included in income under section 103 of the internal revenue code the financial value the economic value includes that interest but the tax basis does not so we have to inc we have to increase for it because if we didn't we'd be taxed on it that's why we also are going to subtract for our share of losses and deductions and also for our share of non-deductible items because if we didn't take those out of the mix then guess what you get the benefit of them, which you're not allowed to do that. No double tax benefit. And then finally, what I want to do is, because we're only talking about simple distributions, we're going to put a little dotted line, and then we're also going to put under the dot. This is the dotted line, sorry. Under the dotted line, we're going to also subtract distributions. Now notice, I put a dotted line there to separate them, but it's still part of the same formula. That's because... When it comes to simple distributions, we're going to do everything above first. Then we take into account all distributions that occur any time during the year. If your calendar year like this business, January 1st, March 1st, December 31st, we all consider them happening at the end of the year after we've gone through all of the items that happen during the year. So I'll explain this in, pro in question four. Okay. But in this problem three, we have no distributions. So we're just going through and determining the basis. So beginning adjusted basis, beginning outside basis was 20 for A. Okay, so we're looking at A's basis during the year. Now, when it comes to the basis, basis does not discriminate. There's no discrimination for ordinary income, capital gain, 1231 gain, even when it comes to deductions, capital losses. Ordinary losses makes no difference. So what does that mean? Because we do all of these together, we can go ahead and take all of the items that the partnership reported, take half of that, a share, and that will be these four items, the, the, the two increases and the two decreases, the net number. And you can put that net number there. Only You can only do this when you have simple distributions. When it's more complex. You can't do this. It's not, it's not as easy. So what we're going to do is we have the 110 ordinary business income loss. We've got the separately stated items. If we lump them together, and we don't lump them together on the return, but we're doing them for purposes of basis calculation now for the share for the partner. So if we add up all the numbers in the separately stated item, we're going to get 90. And then we have 40 from the tax exempt interest income, because remember that gets added in as well. So 110 plus one plus 90 is 200 plus 40 equals 240. So when we're doing our share of basis, each one's 50-50, so that's 120-120 for A and B. So what I'm saying is that these four items can be netted together in a simple distribution like this. So we're going to increase basis for positive 120. There's no distributions in problem three. 
or question three, I should say, my apologies. So that gives us 140. Now that's what happens in question three. We've got 140 a basis. If we do problem four, if we do problem four, now in problem four, it's the same as three, except there's a $40 distribution that happens on March 1st. Well, I've already explained to you in a simple distribution, the rule is that we treat the distributions as occurring at the end of the year. Now, this could make a difference if the rule wasn't like this because you could have activity before March 1st, but not enough to cover basis, which would create capital gain. However, tax law is favorable for taxpayers under simple distributions and allows you to take into account all of these distributions first. So we get 20 plus 120. So that gives us a subtotal of 140. We subtract away the 40, and guess what? We get a $100 basis. Okay? Now, what that does, this is our outside basis going forward in the stock, and then this distribution is not taxable. So this distribution of 40 is not taxable. And those are the consequences with respect to the partner, partnership, and all four of these questions.